All right, so thanks for coming out. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. I know we have a lot of presenters and not a lot of time. And I'm going to try to cover a lot of material very fundamentally because a data center is just too many things to cover all in just 10, 15 minutes. Uh, basically, this is introduction to today's data center, how data centers are handled today, how what technologies are necessary to achieve the things that you want to do, uh, what's the purpose of them, and basically like where you see their future a little bit more headed towards. Uh, who am I? Joe Ganthu. I've been in the IT business for well over 10 years. Uh, I started as a consultant for a small IT consulting company here in the Valley, um, actually Renee's company. Uh, he's uh, one of the members for, for Code RGV and Tech Tuesdays. And um, I've done small business basically for most of my life. Uh, I did seven years with him. I've done server implementations, business design implementations, software implementations, um, a lot of small business stuff. Um, what I do now, I'm the senior systems engineer for International Bank. Basically, I manage their data center. I manage their virtualization environment, their enterprise storage environment, uh, their computing environment, which is their Cisco UCS systems, and a lot of their uh, network and security. I also handle a lot of Windows systems and Microsoft systems, so Exchange, SharePoint. Um, I'm a little bit of everything there, so I mean, if you have any questions or if you want a little bit more background, just let me know. Um, what is a systems engineer? A systems engineer is pretty much somebody that designs and implements systems of varying types. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't necessarily always have to be hardware. Sometimes it can be software systems, video systems. Uh, you basically, you pick a discipline and you kind of become a subject matter expert at that and then you use that to basically design and implement different kinds of systems. And that's pretty much what I do for the bank. So when you're thinking about a data center, um, it's best to start at the smallest level. A data center is basically the same thing that's inside your computer exploded. So you have your standard PC, you know, computer you have at your house, it has certain basic components like a hard drive, a motherboard CPU and memory, uh, a power supply, uh, fans for cooling, and uh, peripherals for video cards, et cetera, et cetera. What happens when you look, when most people look at a data center, they see rows and rows of different racks and they see tons and tons of servers and they see all of these like cables interconnected and everything else coming together. Now, the thing is that when you look at a data center from my perspective, all these things are just, it's just a computer broken into pieces. Several racks are used for storage, several racks are used for computing, basically your motherboard CPU memory. Several racks are used for power, several racks are used for cooling. Everything is just, just think about it that way. It's the simplest, most fundamental way to look at a data center is just to think about your computer at home exploded. So the main categories when it comes to a data center are your storage, your computing, your networking, your power and cooling, and your platform. What platforms are you running on your data center? Are you using this for a Windows platform, Linux platform, virtualization, et cetera, et cetera? When it comes to storage, you have to look at storage a lot differently than you do in your standard computer. When you look at a computer or just a regular small server for a small business, you have maybe a single drive, maybe a couple of drives rated together. In enterprise storage, this is just expanded to a tiered level. So let's say you have a data warehouse and you have a ton of storage that's archival storage. So this is brought into the enterprise storage environment with several racks. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds of hard drives. These hard drives are then tiered out into different capacities and different speeds. So you have solid state drives for very fast read-write and sequential read-write. You have 15,000 RPM hard drives, 10,000 RPM hard drives, 7,200 RPM hard drives. Each tier is basically represented to the performance and price that you're paying for that tier of storage. Now, when you're looking at an enterprise level storage system, these are tiered together into storage groups. These storage groups allow us to basically have the best performance at the best price. Because we can't, I mean, obviously we all want like a thousand solid state drives, but to have a thousand solid state drives, you know, we're talking about millions of dollars. So with an enterprise storage system, the more you write to certain files, the more that they basically house in your faster drives. The less you write to certain files, like let's say I created a PowerPoint three years ago that I never write to anymore, well, that PowerPoint goes into my slow storage, my 7200 RPM storage, or my mass storage. But let's say there is 
a database that I write to every single day that has transactional data for QuickBooks or Quicken or whatever the case may be. And so that stuff stays in my solid state drives because I need to access that stuff quickly and efficiently. Your storage environment is connected to your computing environment different ways. There's fiber channel, which is basically light strands that connect from your storage environments into your UCS, or there's iSCSI, which is basically copper, um, which is basically running through Ethernet cables. These Ethernet cables are the same Ethernet cables you use when you connect your computer to a DSL modem, or you connect your computer to a router, whatever the case may be. And there's also FCOE, which is fiber channel over Ethernet. It's not as common, but it is a growing technology. These all have different varying factors in when you, and why you pick them. Either better performance on writing with small files, better performance on writing with large files, better for video rendering, better for SQL rendering, better for database rendering, so, or database transactional, and those are some of the benefits. <clears throat> okay, so computing. Now computing, that comes down to your servers, your actual hardware. The hardware that you put into your systems is basically comprised of you know, your motherboards, your memory, and your CPUs. This is where the, the actual algorithms and your computations actually take place. Now computing in a data center is a lot different because in the data center you have basically blade environments. You have modular environments that allow for the fact that when you look at a standard server, like let's say you have a server at home or you have a media server that has a bunch of movies or videos or photos, that, that platform that is running on that server is tied to the hardware you're running because you have drivers specific to the hardware you're running. So if you have a video card, you have a and video video card, you have video drivers. If you have a sound card, then you have drivers for that. Now, in a data center, the hardware just becomes hardware. It is not, not important and it's not necessary to have very specific hardware to run on because it's just computations. It's just cranking out data. So you're able to basically, if you have a hardware failure, if you have a blade that goes down, you can just pull the blade, pop another blade in, and you're good to go. This gives you better resiliency to data loss, to hardware failures. It gives you a better upgrade path because if you're reliant on your platform being tied to your hardware, you begin to run into situations where now, like, let's say we want to upgrade all of our servers this year because our servers are like 10 years old. Well, it becomes that much more difficult because now your hardware is, is so tied to the type of, of platform you're running. But in a data center, that's not the case, so you're able to upgrade a lot easier, a lot better, and it's a lot quicker. Networking. Networking, it's probably one of the most complex and overrunning systems because everything connects to networking. In your data center, all your systems are connected via networking, whether it's your storage, your computing, your switches, your networking, your routing, your internet, even this, going back to the fact that you have to connect that to your actual end users. So I'm not going to go too much into to, to networking, but I did want to cover a couple of concepts. Now, the OSI model is, from a data center perspective and from my perspective, I only deal with three of them. I deal with layer two, layer three, and layer seven. Layer two is your physical layer. Layer three is your packet layer, and layer seven is going to be your application layer. Layer two is basically you're concerned with your MAC address. The MAC address is the address that is assigned to the physical adapter on the system. For the IP, you're basically concerned with just the IP address of the computer that you're, you're dealing with or the server you're dealing with or the appliance or whatever the case may be. And layer seven, that's basically the ports. Um, so your applications, like whether it's Skype or SQL or HTTP, HTTPS, they all run at a port. These, these ports basically are the application layer. This is a fundamentally the most standard network topology in a data center. You have your access, your aggregation, and your core. Your core is basically the access level for where your internet comes in. It basically does your routing, your layer three routing. Your aggregation, that's where a lot of the processing goes on. So you have like, that's where you have your data center switches, like these large half rack switches that are just like pumping out data because they're, they're basically, they're bringing in different packets and they're bringing in different things and they're trying to figure out where everything's going. And then you have your layer two switches and those are, most of the time those are gonna be your top of rack switches or the switches that you have in, in different um, areas to connect to the actual computers or the desktops. Then you have power and cooling. So power and cooling in a data center is critical because, I mean, you're running hundreds and hundreds of different systems and you're running them hot and they're running, they generate a lot of power, so you need a lot of redundancy. You need the redundancy because you can't have a power failure. You can't have a database that suddenly does not, is not able to write in the middle of a write. You will corrupt databases, you will corrupt data, you will corrupt anything because that's why you have multi-phase power systems. These multi-phase power systems allow 
the resiliency of power loss. You also have in-row coolers in the cooling environment that get basically pull, pulls heat from the front of the, or sorry, pulls heat from the, the cool air from the front of the system, pushes it to the back, and exposes the, the, the hot air to the back of the systems. So you're pushing cool air through the front, through the systems, to allow for a cooler environment. And then your platforms. Why, are you, why do you have the data center? What, what is this all for? What systems are you trying to run? Are you trying to run a Linux system? Are you trying to run databases? Are you trying to run an Oracle system? Um, most data centers nowadays are virtualized. Most data centers are either partially or completely virtualized. The reason that most data centers are virtualized nowadays is, again, same thing, resiliency. You need to be able to be in an environment that if there is a data failure, if there is some type of catastrophe, you're able to recover that data very quickly. You're also doing it for the fact is going back to the hardware computing perspective. If you're in a virtual environment, the, the drivers and all of this is standardized. All of this virtualization is standardized. What that allows you to do in a virtual environment is it doesn't matter what hardware you have because now you've standardized all your drivers and all of your components that connect your software to your, to your hardware. So with that connection, uh, you're able to basically, like I said, pull out hardware. If you, if, you get, if you get new processors, they're able to compute correctly as long as your platforms can keep up with the new hardware improvement. And I don't know if I ran that quick or I don't know how many minutes I ran that through. 11 minutes, so. <laughs> so, um, any questions? Uh -huh. it, it basically depends on the type of vendor you're looking for. A lot of vendors specialize in different types of systems. So, uh, my, I guess my specialty is EMC, so that's where I have my, like, I guess certific certifications. But, it, it, like I said, it depends. You, you do become reliant on their vendors, but at the end of the day, it's storage. It's, it's data. So, if you don't like a certain vendor, all you got to do is transfer your data from that vendor to another vendor. It's just hard drives at the end of the day. So, you're not exactly, I want to say, 100% reliant on that vendor. If you want to change vendors, it's just moving your data. Now, it becomes a, I guess, a pain when you're talking about, like, if you've got to transfer 10,000 hard drives, you know, from, or 10,000 hard drives worth of data to another, that is like, that causes downtime. So that, I guess that's where that, that reliance comes in, making sure that the systems that you're migrating to have the resiliency to be able to handle that kind of downtime or handle a live transfer. Oh, okay, so that, that's a good question. Um, so enterprise storage in the years, and, and I think it's it, it really the future of enterprise storage is going to be cloud storage. Now, not to say that it isn't going to be completely reliant um, or it's going to change that much because, honestly, small and medium businesses are the only ones that are really pushing for that cloud storage because they don't have to rely on, on hardware maintenance. They don't have to rely on having staff on site to basically manage and, you know, restore that data or to, you know, do upgrades, et cetera, et cetera, because it's all managed on a cloud system. But large enterprise companies are still going to be going to those storage systems because mainly data security. Regulated systems like, like financial institutions, um, people that have to basically have a certain amount of regulation are still going to be doing enterprise storage because of that reason. Now, there is a lot of, like, you know, Office 365, they just reached, like, a PCI compliance. Um, there's a lot of systems that are cloud computing systems that are trying to get that compliancy in their own systems, but at the end of the day, a lot of these, like, a lot of the regulations, I mean, they require like things like you have to have a fence around your racks that goes a certain amount high, and then you have a fence on the top, and like so it's it's actually physical security that comes into play that is actually outlined in these regulations. So that's where the cloud computing gets into this gray area because since you can't physically be at the cloud provider, you can't guarantee there's regulation, so then they have to get certified third party, and it's just, it becomes like a, basically just like, the, I guess, a lot more paperwork. <laughs> yeah, regulatory. Uh, oh, yeah, okay.
cookie. Yeah, no, cakes are made. Well, it kind of depends. Like I said, it depends on the compliance that they are they abide to. What what do you know? What compliance Kickstarter abides to? Uh -huh. Well, not everything. Just because they're you're you're handling like monetary transactions doesn't mean you need to be PCI compliant. Like you have to basically be transacting a certain amount of money and a certain amount of. Like, like there's, if, if there's actually financial data for, like, if you're housing the data, yeah. Yeah, merchant services usually don't because you're not housing, most of the time you're not housing and keeping the financial information of the customer. You're just transacting a deal. You know what I mean? So if you're, trans, if you're just doing a transaction, then the compliancy isn't as strict as, like, for a bank, you have, we have to keep our financial data. So we actually have to hold on to that data. And we have all your transactions, and we have all that stuff that has to be secured. So that's where that compliance comes in. Renee? We usually have bake-offs. Like we'll have a bake-off. Like you know, we'll we'll look at multiple vendors and we'll we'll basically say like have like proof of concepts constructed. So you'll see that once you get to a point where you're looking at like multi-million-dollar like data centers, the vendors are a lot more resi or more acceptable to want to lend you their hardware so you can try it out. So that's a lot of what I do actually. Most of the time, I'm dealing with vendors and I'm trying out new systems. And like, I'm, if I have a new security initiative, or if I'm having, I have to build a data center in another city, then I have to start figuring out what technology am I going to use, how am I going to implement it, and do I want to switch vendors? Do I want to be vendor agnostic? Do I not want to be vendor agnostic? And what are the benefits of even switching? You know, is there actually any benefits? And does the, do the benefits outweigh the cost of me having to migrate my my information and my data? So, like I said, it, it, it kind of depends on, on the situation. It depends on, on, on the application. Uh, but, yeah, most of the time, we'll, 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 like I said, we'll have a bake-off and, and try to figure out which system works best for us and see also what systems integrate with other systems. That's a big thing that I've always been a proponent of is making sure that what systems we, we're, we're, we're integrating have, like, or be able to communicate with other systems correctly. And they have open standards that, that we can use to monitor or to uh, automate different systems. Well, actually, we, uh, we're, a, we're not located in Monterrey. We're actually we're owned here in the U.S. We're, we're, we're owned by Banorte, which is the sixth largest bank in Mexico. So, and they're a publicly traded company, you know, large, large bank, large bank. Um, so we are owned by them, but we're not necessarily, we're, we don't run anything out of Mexico. But we do have to deal with a lot of transactions between us and our parent bank because of those reasons. And what was your question specifically? Well, the thing is that like we don't we don't none of their data center doesn't touch our data center. We don't we, the, honestly we can't because we we were federally regulated, so we can't share our customer information with them. It's just not 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 allowed. It's just there's too much chance for fraud to happen, like money laundering or anything like that. Because now we're taking the data that is housed by us, our customer information, and we're sharing it with a completely different entity. They may own our bank, but they don't own like I guess like their customers' information because that's 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 the bank's property. U.S. interests, because it's just like they can't, they're federally regulated, but they're federally regulated in Mexico. So in order for them to have U.S. interests to build business in the U.S., they have to have a bank here in the U.S. So that's how they do loans and that's how they generate revenue and stuff like that in the U.S. That's their, it's their U.S. entity. Like, how has virtualization been adopted? 
we're 100 percent virtualized. Yeah, we're 100 percent virtualized. All of our systems are virtualized. Um, it's just so much easier to virtualize, honestly. It's not even just like from a data resiliency perspective, it's also from a licensing perspective, from a cost perspective. Because let's say we started going into a situation where we have to license for Microsoft servers. Well, every Microsoft server licensing works by processor. So if we were to have like, we have over 100, 200 servers. Um, if we were to have licensed all those servers by processor, there are renewal would be like in the you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. What well, is it? Hundreds of like I mean like in the millions of dollars, versus with a data center license from Microsoft Server, you're not you're basically only paying for the cores. Um, so we're able to create a spin up as many servers as we can on that platform or on that UCS chassis platform, which is our sister UCS. Oh, like do we have a like a like a VDI environment? Is that what you're asking me? No. Huh? No, no, we don't do terminals. We don't. It's something that I want to adopt. It's something that I'm pushing for in the future. But right now, we do have thick stations still, and um, and it's something that we want to adopt. Same reason though. Same reason. Licensing is cheaper. Uh, data resiliency is cheaper. If a system crashes at, at a at a branch or somewhere else, it's just so much easier to spin up a new VM than it is to have to reprovision that OS. Because right now, when we have to reprovision OS, we have to basically send the OS over the network, let it reprovision, and, and that, that person goes down for a certain amount of time. Versus at our data center, we're able to reprovision an OS very quickly because we have more processing power than a standard desktop does. <laughs> well, we have different security safeguards to, to prevent that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not just because security, like I said, security is a massive. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation in, in, when you're talking about data security, because we have layer seven inspection that allows us to basically monitor the applications that are being accessed by different users. We're able to see what applications are communicating outside the bank. So if there's a worm outbreak or some kind of system gets compromised, we're able to see if like a system is for some reason dialing out to China. We're able to see that in real time. Um, so that, that's what gives us some of that, 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 um, that analytics. Now, the other thing we do, especially with file systems, and that, that's more of the crypto locker question, is uh, we track all of the files that are accessed on the, on the bank's network. So any kind of Microsoft file, any, any Excel sheet that's opened, any PowerPoint that's opened, it gets monitored and accessed, and it, it, it gets seen where it came from, where it got transferred from, and what, if it's trying to talk to something else. And that's the, really the most important part. Because if you over, open a PowerPoint, it shouldn't be trying to talk to anything. You know, and when we're tr when we open a PowerPoint and, and it does try to talk to something, we're able to isolate that dynamically using uh, our malware system. So it basically depends on what kind of infection you're talking about. If it's a network infection, if it's an outbreak, if it's a worm, if it's a DDoS attack, we have different systems for different security concerns. Because like I said, security is massive. Like if you're if you're looking for a new career, security is huge. And security, I mean, with Target and Home Depot and everybody else getting compromised. Security is huge right now. Yeah, so I'm going to be covering the same subjects, except I will actually go into them. Because right now, like, like I said, I only had 10 minutes, and I actually did 11. So, uh, <laughs> so I did it pretty well. I was trying to do it quickly, like I said. But next week, if you guys are interested, definitely come out, code RGV. I'll be doing it for two hours, and I'll actually have a lab going. So I'll set up a virtual environment. Like I'll set up VMware. I'll set up. Um, servers, and I'll show you a little bit more on how the networking works and how the storage connects to the, to the servers themselves. So that'll give you a little bit more of insight into what I'm actually talking about versus right now I just kind of threw it at you really quick and, and it kind of gave you some terms and kind of some ideas and concepts to look at. Um, but like I said, if, you, if you're more interested into wanting to learn a little bit more about this, definitely come out next week. Anybody else?